ever wondered what all the fuss was about with the film Woodstock? Well, get ready because there's a lot more to it than just groovy music and muddy fields. This documentary captures the essence of a generation, showcasing the highs and lows of a historic event. From hilarious backstage antics to shocking moments of rebellion, the movie is packed with surprises. But before we dive into the wild tales, let's set the scene. Picture this, it's the summer of 69 and a sea of hippies descends upon a dairy farm in upstate New York. What follows is three days of peace, love, and unforgettable performances by some of the greatest musicians of all time. Now, as promised, get ready for some jaw-dropping revelations. Did you know that some artists were paid in food instead of cash? Or that the organizers had to airlift medical supplies because the roads were jammed with traffic? And let's not forget the infamous brown acid incident, but enough about the movie. We want to hear from you. Do you have a special memory associated with this film? Or maybe there's a lesser known fact that fascinates you. Share your stories and memories in the comments below. We can't wait to hear from you. Keep watching for more funny, shocking, and sad facts about Woodstock. Trust us, you won't want to miss it. Woodstock is a famous movie from 1970 that's all about the legendary music festival in 1969. It happened in upstate New York and became really important for culture. The movie shows what went down during a three-day festival on a farm owned by a guy named Max Yasger. It's got awesome performances by big name musicians like Jimi Hendrix and Janis Joplin. Loads of people showed up to have a good time and enjoy music, especially during a tough time with the Vietnam War. The film is like a documentary showing not just the great music, but also how hard it was for the organizers to handle so many people. It captures the excitement and hope of young people back then, as well as the problems and fights happening in society. The main characters are the musicians and all the folks who came to the festival. They talk about what it was like in interviews, giving us a good look at what things were like at the time. Woodstock got lots of awards and praise, including an Oscar for Best Documentary Feature. It's a timeless reminder of how powerful music and coming together can be for making a difference in the world. Amidst the lineup for the festival, Led Zeppelin declined the invitation to perform, opting for a concert nearby in New Jersey. Meanwhile, in a fleeting moment during an interview, a newspaper stand flashed a headline about Sharon Tate's murder, the talk of the town following the Manson family tragedy. Despite Dylan's residency nearby, he turned down the offer to headline, later criticizing the organizers for their exploitation of the town and dismissing the festival goers as mere kids on acid with flowers in their hair, distancing himself from the scene. In a fascinating twist of events, the performance of Sweet Judy Blue Eyes by Crosby Stills and Nash wasn't captured during the festival itself, but added post-event, as producer Artie Kornfeld revealed. Jethro Tull, despite being invited, declined to perform due to lead singer Ian Anderson's reluctance to play for what he called unwashed hippies. Interestingly, during an NBC interview with Michael Lang and Artie Kornfeld, the band's song Serenade to a Cuckoo played in the background, highlighting the irony of the situation. Moreover, a legal dispute arose when a musician sued the filmmakers and distributor for using his performance of Mess Call on his flugelhorn at 4 a.m. without consent, though the lawsuit was unsuccessful. Amidst the backdrop of the Omega Man's cinematic universe, Robert Neville finds solace in a screening of a notable 1970 documentary. The event captured the essence of an era, drawing in audiences worldwide. Governor Nelson Rockefeller's alarm at the overwhelming crowd threatened to escalate the situation. He contemplated deploying National Guard troops to disperse the masses, underscoring the magnitude of the gathering. Crosby, Stills, Nash, and Young narrowly escaped a tragic fate en route to their performance. A malfunctioning helicopter pushed Graham Nash and their bassist Greg Reeves perilously close to disaster. Only a stroke of luck spared them from a fatal outcome. At the brink of financial collapse, the who almost backed out from the event, insisting on cash payment. However, they eventually took the stage, delivering an iconic performance. Despite initial reluctance, Jimi Hendrix was persuaded by his manager to participate in the festival. The film capturing the essence of the event has earned its place on Roger Ebert's esteemed list of great movies. The pressure on Hendrix was applied during a private meeting in upstate New York, eventually leading to his historic performance. The Rolling Stones declined an invitation to perform at the festival because Mick Jagger was in Australia filming Ned Kelly. Additionally, Keith Richards' girlfriend Anita Pallenberg had recently given birth to their first child, Marlon. Despite being a success artistically, the festival proved to be a financial disaster. 
Surprisingly, the film and soundtrack were the only profitable aspects, despite the promoters not investing in them initially due to a belief that they wouldn't generate revenue. During the Who's performance of We're Not Gonna Take It, the sunrise coincidentally occurred at the most dramatic moment of the song, prompting the band to incorporate special lighting effects in future concerts to replicate the aesthetic impact. In the movie, despite his portrayal as a stone teenager, Artie Kornfeld held a significant role as an executive producer at Capitol Records. Interestingly, Janice Joplin initially didn't feature in the film. She disliked her Woodstock performance and refused its use. Gail Whittington, a pioneering gay activist, recounted an encounter with Joplin in San Francisco, where she expressed regret over accepting the Woodstock invitation. Only after her death did her performance get added to the director's cut. The festival spanned from August 15th to the 17th, later extending to the 18th. This extension accommodated the overwhelming attendance and prolonged celebrations. Amidst the busy rush to get everything ready for Richie Haven's performance, there was an announcement about Eddie Kramer in the soundtrack. Kramer was a famous studio engineer who had worked with big rock stars like Jimi Hendrix and others who were going to perform at the festival. Joni Mitchell got asked to perform, but she didn't show up because her manager was worried she'd miss her first appearance on national TV on the Dick Cavett show due to all the traffic. Later, she wrote a song called Woodstock, made famous by Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young, with Graham Nash, her boyfriend at the time. The original plan for the festival was to have a bunch of concerts and use the money raised to build a recording studio in the Woodstock area, where lots of talented musicians lived. The event sparked perpetual debates regarding its standout performances, but certain acts emerged as iconic over time. Among these were Joe Cocker's rendition of With a Little Help from My Friends, Carlos Santana's electrifying soul sacrifice, Crosby, Stills, and Nash's harmonious sweet Judy Blue Eyes, Sly, and the Family Stone's energetic hire, and Jimi Hendrix's unforgettable rendition of the Star Spangled Banner. Not to forget Wavy Gravy and Tom, the Porto Sand Maintenance Man. During the Who's performance, Pete Townsend's ire wasn't solely directed at Abby Hoffman. As they took the stage, Townsend inadvertently kicked the documentary's cameraman, who turned out to be none other than the film's director, Michael Wadley. The film holds a place of honor among cinephiles, featuring in 1001 Movies You Must See Before You Die, edited by Steven Schneider. During negotiations to secure the Grateful Dead for the festival, their manager at the time insisted on adding one of two other acts he represented to the lineup. One of the promoters faced a dilemma after being unable to choose between the bands, It's a Beautiful Day and Santana. To resolve the issue, he resorted to flipping a coin and Santana emerged as the winner. The coin flip not only determined their spot at the event, but also played a role in propelling Santana to fame, both at the festival and in the subsequent film. Jimi Hendrix, a central figure at the event, performed with the group initially named Band of Gypsies, Sons and Rainbows, later shortened to Band of Gypsies. Notably, conga player Juma Sultan, a member of this band, had previously played alongside jazz legend John Coltrane in Coltrane's final concert before his passing in 1967. This unique distinction makes Juma Sultan the sole musician to have recorded with both Coltrane and Hendrix, adding a historical layer to his musical journey. During the Who's performance, Pete Townsend took a notable stand. Yippie leader Abby Hoffman interrupted the show to express discontent about it and advocate for imprisoned radical John Sinclair. In response, Townsend promptly kicked Hoffman off the stage, asserting control over the performance and redirecting the focus back to the music. In summary, the dynamics of the event included a chance coin flip determining Santana's inclusion, Juma Sultan's bridging of musical legends, and Pete Townsend's assertive response to a show interruption. These incidents added layers of interest and significance to the event and its portrayal in the film.